Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Thank you, Ricky and Steve and Anton. That was a beautiful song. Just hope we sing that again soon. Or you sing it and I listen. I always feel like I, I sing like Anton in my head. But I, I don't with my mouth so much. Well, we're at the close of a, ser a series called Jesus of the Prophets, looking back through the eyes of the Old Testament prophets, these quirky, strange men who looked forward in hope and faith, and how Christ fulfilled their hopes and their longings, and how he still fulfills ours today. We come to the end of this series. How many of you like deadlines? You work best when there's a looming deadline. Who likes deadlines? It's a few of you strange people. How many of you are master procrastinators? You're really good at putting things off. Well, whichever you are, there's something about having a day approaching, isn't there? Like final exam day, tax day, wedding day, the day of a birth, moving day. Or like my wife and daughter went on a spring break, because it was her college spring break. They went to see my folks in Arizona, and I, and I had this list of things I was going to get done while she was gone. You know, really bless her when she came home. And I, I didn't do any of those things. <laughs> As the day got closer, I kept looking at the list, wasn't getting shorter, but the days were getting shorter, and then it's like the day she's coming back, and I'm like, oh no, I had seven days and I did nothing. <laughs> we're coming to the end of our series, as I said, where we look at the, the prophet's view of, of how Jesus fulfills their longings. We looked at the prophet Micah, and we saw how Jesus is the future king who will return, the returning king. And then we looked at the prophet Hosea, the strange story about God telling this ancient prophet to marry an unfaithful woman to teach him about his heart for us when we are unfaithful to him. He's our true bridegroom. And then we looked at the prophet Zechariah, who has this court case in heaven where the, the accuser stands there accusing him before God, but the righteous advocate Jesus stands defending his case. And then last two weeks at prophet Isaiah, both the child who will be born to rule and the suffering servant who is wounded for us and pierced for us and carries our sorrows. So we wrap up the series and we're going to go to an appropriate place, the very last book, the very last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament, the Italian prophet Malachi. <laughs> it's a pastor joke, but I think it's funny. Okay, turn to Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. We'll read the whole chapter. It's only six verses. For behold, the day is coming burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for there will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now, can we, let's just be honest for a minute. This, these six verses move from really troubling, disturbing images to really nice images. It's like, oh, the, ugh. Burning stubble, oh, healing in his wings. Trampling ashes, oh, we're going to be children who love their daddies. It's a, it's, it's, I have to admit, when I read this passage, I thought, huh, this is not going to be very popular. And I like to, for you to like me. So I worry about what it's going to sound like. But here's the truth. My job isn't that. It's to tell you what the Word of God says as graciously and as clearly as I can tell you. And I freely admit, this is, a, this is not a popular message today. This day of the Lord and ideas of judgment and what does all this mean? The first thing I want you to see, and it's the theme throughout Malachi and all of the New Testament, in the Old Testament as well, there is a day coming. There is a day coming. The central theme of, uh, is that, of the prophets is there's the day of the Lord. The day when God will enter back into history specifically and act in judgment to enact justice and to heal and restore. There's a day coming. Now, the book of Malachi, if you've read through it, his prophecy is written kind of as a conversation between the people of God, Israel, and God himself, where God accuses them and says, points out some issues they have, and they sort of defend themselves back, and then God points out again, and then in this last part, he, 
he judges them or says he's going to. So Malachi 4 is written as an answer to a question that the people of God ask God. Here's that question in chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. It's not written as a question, but see if you can hear what they're asking. In verse 14, you have said, this is God speaking, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Can you hear the question? What's the question? Is it worth it? This following you, God, obeying you, God? I mean, I look around at the world and I see people who don't give a rip about you and they're prospering. They're doing whatever they want and they're winning. And the innocent are suffering. And people like us who are trying to be faithful, we struggle while those who are oppressing others and rejecting your law and flaunting their sin, they're getting away with it. That's the last part, right? They put God to the test and they escape. They're actually saying, God, where is your justice? Where's the justice in this? Maybe it's a question you've asked, if not out loud in your heart. Maybe you looked at your own life out at the world and you thought, where is the justice in this? And chapter 4 is God's answer. It's coming, is what he says. It's coming. There is a day coming. Don't mistake that. The all-important question, verse 1 again. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. Not an easy bake oven, different kind of oven. When all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble, that day is coming, shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. He's saying sin and injustice will not go on forever. Now remember, this is the final book of the final, uh, the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament. After this book, Malachi, there's 400 years of prophetic silence. For 400 years, you're not going to hear a prophet speak the word of God until Christ is born and God begins to speak through Jesus, his son. This is his final word to us and to his people. It's a warning and a promise. And it resounds throughout the entire Bible, the Old Testament. The prophets are kind of leaning forward, looking into this day of the Lord. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 2 says. And Isaiah 2 is all about the day of the Lord. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. And in chapter 13, verse 6, wail, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. The day of the Lord, when God will right every wrong, enact justice and judgment. All of history is not cyclical. The wheel in the sky does not just keep on turning. You don't just go round and round and round. We are marching, moving all of history toward a day. That's the message of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And there will come a day when he'll return. The New Testament says this as well in Acts chapter 17, verse 31. Because he, God, has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he's given us assurance to all by raising him from the dead. He's fixed a day. Not actually a single 24-hour period, by the way. But a, a series of events that start when Christ returns and culminate in the new heavens and new earth reality. So, like, for example, heaven... Popular culture says heaven is you're going to become like a little baby wearing a diaper and get wings and float up in, on a cloud and play a harp. That sounds more like hell to me than heaven, actually. That's not heaven. Heaven, I don't want to be a baby in a diaper playing a harp for all eternity, right? That's not heaven. Heaven is Christ returns and wipes out every sin, wipes away every tear, undoes every injustice, and rebuilds the earth and his kingdom in beauty and in glory, and we live with him forever. That's heaven. It comes to us, not we float up somewhere. And the day of the Lord is all the events from when he returns to when that is established. And, and, there's, and part of that, those events, is judgment. It ought to make us tremble a little bit. But it also ought to make us glad. Psalm 98, verse 9, Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. And I know it sounds ominous and upsetting. But actually, for those that are in Christ, it's good news. It should be. Most of us live our lives, me included, as if my present circumstances are going to go on for all eternity. That this is life. And I don't think about the eternity at all. If I do, it's very in vague terms. But this is real, this life. 
and I interpret my future reality based on my present circumstances. And the Bible says you should do the exact opposite. You should interpret your present circumstances based on your future reality, not the other way around. You should interpret your present decisions, choices, relationships, investments of your resources, your time, your energy, your prayer, your thoughts, based on what's coming and not the other way around. Second thing I think this is good news is it enables us to freely forgive. We should be able to forgive freely because the coming day of the Lord where he will judge. I talk to people who think it works this way. Look, God's not, God is a God of mercy and grace and love, and he is. And he would never judge anybody. He accepts everybody freely, and so I shouldn't either. That's a common idea. It's only partly true. God is a God of mercy and justice and love. He's also a God of judgment. You can't have justice without judgment. Listen to what Miroslav Volf writes. He's a Croatian theologian, grew up in the former Soviet Yugoslavia. He lived through the ethnic cleansing wars in the Balkans in his homeland. And he wrote a book called Exclusion and Embrace. And he has two whole chapters that are profound on what real forgiveness means and how it's possible when you see horrible injustice on a massive scale. How do you forgive? How do the Holocaust survivors forgive the Nazi party? How do his people in, the, in Croatia forgive those who tried to wipe out an entire people group? Here's what he writes. If God were not angry at injustice and did not might make a final end to human violence, that God would not be worthy of worship. The only means of prohibiting all recourse to human violence is to insist that violence and judgment is legitimate only when it comes from God. My thesis that the practice of nonviolence and forgiveness requires a belief in divine vengeance will be unpopular with many in the comfortable West. But, now listen to this, it takes the quiet of a suburban home for the birth of the idea that human nonviolence results from the belief in God's refusal to judge. In a sun-scorched land soaked in the blood of the innocent, it will invariably die with many other pleasant captivities of the liberal mind. He doesn't mean politically liberal, he means theologically liberal there. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, because I can trust God to handle all the injustice, because I can trust that the day is coming when he will set all wrongs right and he will punish, I don't have to. I'm free to let go of that and forgive because I can trust him. I'm not qualified to be judge anyway, but he is and he will. I know it's easy to look around the world today and wonder, where is your justice, God? Why don't you do something? But, but please don't make the mistake of thinking that because God delays, that it's not going to happen. He will ultimately bring his judgment. Now, interestingly, most Americans don't believe in a hell, but they do believe in a heaven. It's curious. I can understand that. Malachi is telling us the day of the Lord brings both God's righteous judgment and his gracious restoration. The next thing I want you to see is there is a sun rising. Malachi switches metaphors from burning to the sunrise. How when you first read this, uh, you might be tempted to think he misspelled the word sun. Let's read verse 2. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Now, it's spelled S-U-N, and you might think, well, isn't it S-O-N? And yes, it is a reference, a messianic reference to the rise of Jesus and his return, but it's spelled S-U-N on purpose. Uh, the, the sun will rise with healing in its wings. Does the sun have wings? Well, in Psalm 139, David says, I, if I rise on the wings of the dawn, he means the sun's rays like wings spreading out over all of the earth. The Hebrew word for wings is the word kanaf. It's used a number of times in the Bible to refer to the sun's rays, Eagle's wings, kanaf, and also, curiously, it's sometimes referred to as edge, hem, or fringe on garments, on cloaks. And we're told that the sun, when he rises, will bring healing in his kanaf, in his wings. This time of year, I'm always checking my weather app for the little sun icon poking out from behind the cloud. You know, oh, tomorrow, for, for like three hours, yes, right? 
The prophets look forward to the rise of the sun. And Revelation 21, verses 22 and 23 says, when this happens, ultimately, we won't even need the sun, the burning ball of gas millions of miles away. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun nor moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Now, when you read this, verse 1 and 2, it's easy to make a mistake and think, man, I don't like this because it sounds like God is saying, when I rise, when I come on the day of the Lord, I'm going to burn up some people, but I'm going to be nice to these people. It, it, that's upsetting, isn't it? If you read it that way, that's, it's God is not going, these people I'm angry with and these people I like. That's not what's happening here. It's saying, when the Son of Righteousness returns and rises, he will rise. And those who have rep- trusted in him, surrendered their life to him, received his mercy and grace, it will be healing and warmth and light. And those who have hardened their heart and rejected him and gone their own way, it will be like an oven. It's not like he's arbitrarily deciding who gets blessed and who doesn't. It's saying what it will be like for those that are in him and those that are not when he comes and rises as the sun. Now this idea of wings is interesting. Healing in his wings. It's a fascinating image. As I mentioned before, the word kanaf can mean wings. It can also mean corner, edge, hem, or fringe. This is a prayer shawl I bought in Jerusalem when my wife and I were there a number of years ago. Uh, You'll see these today. Orthodox Jews will wear these. They wear a different version. It goes actually over their head and under their cloaks. Sometimes you'll see Orthodox Jews with the tassels hanging out. These tassels here at the end, these cords, have five knots on them for the five books of the Torah, so you'd wrap them around your fingers and you'd, it'd remind you, tactile reminder of God's law. But they would wear these prayer shawls in Jesus' day uh, over their head and shoulders when they would pray. And can you get the idea now where wings come from? Healing in his wings. There's the story in Mark 5, some of you might remember this story, of a woman who sees Jesus in a crowd, and she's had a a bleeding issue for 12 years that the doctors and physicians can't heal. And she thinks, if I just touch what? The kanaf of his robe, I'll be healed. So she pushes her way through the crowd, and she reaches out, and she touches the kanaf, the, the corner, the wings of his garment, and she is healed. And Jesus goes, who touched me? And the disciples are like, there's like a billion people. What do you mean who touched you? He's like, no, someone touched me. Jesus felt power go out from him of faith, meaning somebody believed Malachi 4.2. Somebody believed this and touched me in faith. And he says to her, your faith has healed you. What was her faith? The son of righteousness will rise and there will be healing in his wings. In Mark chapter 6, verse 56, we read this. And wherever he came in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him they might touch even the fringe, kanaf, of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. It's a messianic prophecy. When the sun rises, there'll be healing and restoration and protection and grace and mercy in his wings. Under the wings of God is a place where his people are meant to be. Psalm 91, verse Four tells us that he will shelter you under his feathers and protect you under the shadow of his wings, Kanaf. But we're also told that Malachi says that we were brought in under his wings for healing and mercy and grace and protection. We're also sent out. The next little image is that we're going to go out leaping like calves. Is that weird? I've seen YouTube videos of baby goats jumping. Have you seen these videos? There's like billions of them. They're cute. I could watch them for hours. Goats jumping around all over the place. I didn't know that calves jump. But I did some sermon research, and I found this video on YouTube. make you happier than watching calves leaping. Huh? Is it me or did the, the one calf try to kick that other calf? So we don't live in agrarian society. Maybe you grew up on a farm, but apparently this is a thing. 
In the spring, when calves have been born, they've been in the stall for a long time, they're first let out, they run and jump and leap. That's the image that Malachi gives us of what it will be like on the day of the Lord for those that are in Christ. It's uninhibited joy. A good friend of mine says, true love is like dancing. You really can't do it if you're afraid of looking like a fool. If you're worried about what other people are going to think of you, you can't really love well or worship well. Oh, praise him. Right, you know? We're worried about how it's going to feel, what it's going to feel like, what people are going to think of us. This is an image of totally unselfconscious, uninhibited joy because there's healing and grace and love and light in his wings. Run and jump and be free. That's the image. The coming day of the Lord is a day of healing and restoration and freedom and joy for those who have turned to Jesus. And the day is coming. And last, there'll be hearts turning. There will be hearts turning. The book of Malachi and the whole Old Testament ends with this interesting passage about turning hearts, fathers to children and children to fathers. Turning is the biblical idea of repentance. It means I'm headed in the wrong direction, and by the grace of God, I recognize that I'm going the wrong way. And he moves in my heart and, and moves me to turn around and go the other direction. That's repentance. It's, it's a churchy word, I know, but that's what it means. It means I recognize this is wrong. This is not where I want my life to be. And I turn around back to God, my Father, back to other people. I turn my heart back to the direction God wants me to go. And that's the image he gives us, particularly in the context of fathers and children. Let's read verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Elijah, by the way, is a reference to John the Baptist who would come preparing the one. Uh, we won't have time to get into all of that. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now this sounds like God is saying, unless you dads be nice and you kids be nice to your dads, I'm going to smite you. It's not actually what he's saying. What he's saying is, the destruction of a society, a culture, a civilization, a nation is imminent if fathers don't love their kids and if kids don't honor and love their dads. We're spending millions, billions on education and social programs to, do, to fill in the gap of what dads are supposed to be doing. Now, moms, you're not off the hook. This doesn't mean it doesn't apply to other relationships. But in my experience as a pastor, we, don't, we have a lot more daddy issues than mommy issues. There's a lot more father wounds in people's hearts. There are a lot more absentee spiritual dads than moms in homes. And I think what Malachi is saying, what God is saying to the prophet is, you want to see if God's at work in a church or in the world? Look at the men. Are they humble? Are they turning their hearts to me? That's a sign. It's one of my great prayers for our church. And again, it applies to all relationships, to all of us, but there's a reason, I think, Malachi mentions it this way. And you don't get the father's heart by just having a child. You get it by becoming his child, by his grace. I, I, I want to show you a video clip that expresses this better than I could ever say it. One of the places where I've seen Malachi 4-6 in action and it's a place that will surprise you. It's the largest maximum security prison in our nation, in Louisiana. It's a ministry there called Malachi Dads, where these men go through a two-year discipleship program. They're serving life sentences, many of them for murder. And they have their hearts transformed by the grace of Jesus, the healing in his wings. They turn from their sin. And one of the first re results of that is they want to love their kids better on the inside of prison walls than they ever did on the outside. I want you to watch this with me, and then we'll, we'll finish by coming to his table. It's a thousand places in the world I'd rather be right now than in prison. Because I met my father in prison. I always said growing up that I never wanted to be like my father. And unfortunately, what I turned out to be is exactly like my father. Hey, Daddy, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm off probation now, and I'm staying out of trouble. I might play basketball for Shreveport if my friend talks to his coach. I've gotten even better on the basketball court. I can't wait till the next time I see you so I can dunk on you. Smiley face. I love you, Daddy. And out of everything you said, it wasn't to the end of it that just really crushed me when he said, I love you, Daddy. Because that's all I desire for my son to do, is just to really love me. 
in a sense, I felt as if I failed him because I know how much he need me. I didn't know what it's like to be a father as a kid myself. I was only 16 when my daughter was born. My dad was non-existent. He basically abandoned me. I met my father while I was in prison. I didn't never really have my father there with me. My dad was incarcerated. He never gave me any virtues or values. I never really understood what fatherhood was about. He was never there. He was never consistent. He was always just this random pop-up guy. All I ever wanted my daddy would do was just tell me that he loved me. My son didn't wrong me. I, I wronged my son. I now have cultivated a relationship with my daughter. See, I didn't know you have to have a relationship. I didn't know that. <laughs> now I know. I have to be the one who actually make the sacrifices, the necessary sacrifices to see, you know, reconciliation, healing take place. Now, last time I talked to her, I asked her, was she mad at me? She said, for what, Daddy? I said, for not really being in your life like I should have been. She said, man, she said, Dad, I forgive you because I know people make mistakes, and you made a mistake, and you made a bad decision, and it cost you. And I told her, I said, babe, I'm glad you understand that because my choice and my decision wasn't, I didn't choose what I did over you. And it doesn't make me less concerned. I love you lesser because I did what I did. I'm singing with the heavenly host. My biggest fear is by prison that I would meet my son in prison. One I talk day. to my daughter more than I ever did, but I don't even know what it's like to embrace her, to hold her. I've been gone that long. And I need to, I need to hold her. I really do. I really do. This day, Returning Hearts Day, it's focused on the father and the child alone. It means so much to them because, number one, it means we trust them. We, the prison, trust them to be worthy of this visit. All right. Now I'm walking with the angels, high the mountains, I'm seeing I see my son now. There's no restrictions on how they should show affection during that, that moment. How you living? Oh boy, man, you getting tall ass. We'll be walking with the angels high above the mountains. We'll be singing with the heavens. Kim, I miss you, girl. I love you. They get to spend a day together alone. Ready? Just the child and the father. They can build that relationship that was broken. They can restore what was what were the hurts that were that were there, and the father can focus on the child, and the child gets that attention. He looks like you. A Malachi dad is successful when he is reconnected with his children. In spite of his situation with his father being incarcerated. He's reconnected to his children, and he's reconnected to his children in a different way, in a transformed way, in a transformed life, a changed life. And in due time, the child will respond to that, and that relationship is restored. And what can they give but love to their kid? They have no money, but they can give love. God has given me and some of us a, a chance to be there um, in Angola a number of times. The guy, Ed Burton, who was serving 60 years for armed robbery, did you see him? He had three uh, scholarship offers for football to SEC schools. Life set out for him. He had a horrible mistake, and he's serving 60 years. And I got to meet him. He's one of the most gracious, humble, godly men. He's on the inside of the razor wire, but in some ways he's freer than a lot of men that I meet on the outside because of the grace of Jesus of the healing in his wings there's a day coming malachi says don't make a mistake thinking that your life is going to go on like this forever there's a day coming and the place to be is under his wings of grace and mercy and between this day and the day when he returns we're told to remember him to to pursue him to honor him and one of the ways he's given us to remember him is his table that we come to his table to remember what he did for us that the, the judgment of God doesn't fall on us, it falls on Christ because he loves us. And then we're liberated and set free. That's the healing. So in a moment I'm gonna pray and then we'll, we'll distribute the elements, but just if you're here as a, for the first time or if this is not your church home, I just want to remind you, this is not our table, it's the table of Jesus Christ. And so it doesn't matter to us if you're a member here, a regular tender, if you've never been here before. What matters is that you know the love of the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, that you've trusted in him for forgiveness. 
If that's you, you're welcome at his table. Let's bow now to pray as the ushers come forward. Father God, we, we really don't have words to express the depth of our gratitude for all that you have done for us. That we're the ones who run from you and ignore you and forget about you and you pursue us in grace and in mercy and love. Help us by your spirit to see our present life in light of your return. Help us to long for that, look for that, and prepare our hearts for it. And now as we come to your table through the simple elements of bread and cup, help us to remember the depth of your love for us, your sacrifice on the cross, which sets us free. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that there is indeed healing in your wings. Amen.